Hey, welcome today. Thanks for coming out to our class, Natural Stone 101. Uh, I'm Rob Bacon. Uh, we're presenting this class in conjunction with the MIA, the Marble Institute of America. And uh, everything you need to know about designing with the oldest building material is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, this contact information here. One thing we've made a, a very uh, important point to, uh, within our organization here is that our speakers are certified. And they go through a process of training and so anytime you're hearing a course, a CEU course from the MIA, you will find that the, cert the speaker has been certified and that is our little badge to indicate that that training has, has occurred. So it's very important that our message is consistent and clear and, and, uh, and that's the purpose for it. Course number, AIA, IDCEC, and so on. So be sure to fill out the uh, sign-in sheet that I've passed around. Also, if you would, please, there is the evaluation form. So. Uh, those are sitting in front of you now. It's important for us that you do fill those out. Give us your feedback because that's how we determine whether we have hit the mark or we need to do some improvements or maybe there's some new courses we can develop that you have a particular interest in. So please, if you would, fill those out for us. We are registered with the IDCEC and we will do the reporting for you. You get that information back to me at the end of the course and we, we pass it along through and, and the MIA handles all the paperwork for you. All right, so the course here, description of this course here. Um, basically, what we want to go through today is, as, a, as an industry design professional, how do we go about you know, selecting the proper materials? And what's important in that is we got to go back to how is the stuff formed? So we're going to get into that. How is the stuff formed? What type of formations? And what does that mean for us at the end of the day when we try to use it in a particular application? We'll talk about common coring techniques and fabrication methods, finishing methods. And hopefully by the end of this, you'll have some confidence in your ability to at least begin selecting product for your, uh, for your project. Our learning objectives here today, uh, we want to first get an understanding about the composition, mineral composition of stone, how it affects its use. Um, secondly, the science of each species of stone and how it's commonly quarried, fabricated, and finished. And then we'll get into understanding the resources that are available for us in, in designing with natural stone. We've set this course up in a series of modules. And so be paying attention here because at the end of each module, we're going to have a little quiz. And so whether or not you've uh, paid attention and can answer those questions for us is going to determine whether you pass the class. So and that's how we've broken it up here. So let me ask, first of all, how many of you are working with natural stone on a regular basis? How many are designing with stone? Okay, what sort of projects are you working with? And it can be, you know, paving, Interior, what have you. Awesome. So you get, you're not completely foreign. It's not a foreign concept of stone. Very good. Give me a definition of natural stone. Who knows? Without cheating, without looking. It is natural, right? It's natural. So when we're talking about natural stone, it is coming out of the earth and we're not manipulating it any in any way physically other than to say that we're cutting it into the shapes that we want to cut it into. Unlike engineered products, engineered stone, quartz agglomerates, et cetera, which do contain some natural materials, but it's a man-made, it's constituted by man. And so in that sense, we do not classify those, those building materials as natural stone. So we won't be discussing those today. We'll be talking specifically about natural. Natural stone, my favorite slides. Here we have the quarry in New Mexico, a travertine quarry. I'll usually ask here, has anybody been to a quarry? What was your experience there? This is a pretty typical, uh, typical quarry. We, we get different varieties. We'll get into that a little bit later as, as, as far as the different types of quarries. But basically, as we look at a quarry and we go to figure out what kind of stone it is, we have to understand it's basically made up in two different ways. Any stone is can be classified as either calcareous or silicious. And if it's calcareous, it's made up of calcium carbonate, which is similar to what you're going to get in marine, shell, marine animal shells, um, egg shells, things like that, or silicious stones, which are made up of silica or silicates, which is effectively sand or quartz. So this is a very important distinction to understand right at the, right at the outset. Once we go from there, we talk about the formation of stone. So we've got basically three types of formations, sedimentary, metamorphic, and igneous. So calcareous, silicious, and they're going to be formed in one of these three ways. 
We'll talk about sedimentary first. So as the name would imply, sedimentary stones are formed through the processes of erosion, denudation, air, wind, what have you, glaciers that are taking minerals and they're moving them and depositing them typically in a waterbed, a uh, lake, um, a large sea, something along those lines. And over millions and millions of years, the pressure bonds these different layers together. And so what you end up with after those millions of years is a, is a stone. And it's, it's, uh, it's bonded in these layers. And one thing that's very indicative of a sedimentary stone is, as these layers indicate, you've got different strata layering that you can see very clearly as, as each layer builds upon the other and, and, and it bonds to each one. So that's sedimentary. This is a travertine deposit in Turkey. Uh, classic, classic example of the formation. You can even see the strata layering forming uh, there at the edge of the quarry. Next we have metamorphic formation, which is essentially, this occurs within the earth and it's heat and pressure over time. And as the name implies, that material that's subjected to that heat and pressure metamorphosizes. And we can come out with a different type of material than what it started as. So that could be a marble. It could have started as a limestone. It could have started as any sort of stone. But with that, with that application of heat and pressure, it changes or metamorphosizes. And then the last formation, igneous. And this is effectively igneous fire. So think of cooling magma, cooling lava. And we have intrusive which would be it's cooled internally within the earth, or extrusive or volca volcanic, which it's left the core of the earth and is, it has cooled uh, extrusively or outside of the surface of the earth. Now, just quickly, of those, about 95% of the earth, the stone we work with out of the earth is igneous. Most of it is igneous. We get a, we get a smaller percentage on the earth's crust of the limestones and, and the marbles, but most of it is igneous. Okay, so we take this information and we put it on a little matrix here to help us see it a little better. We have the calcareous and we have the silicious types or makeups. And then from left to right, sedimentary, metamorphic, and igneous. So we start to classify our materials here. So calcareous sedimentary, we've got our limestones, our travertines, and our onyxes, which as you, as you probably have seen, that sedimentary laying is very, is, is very visible in most of those materials. Calcareous metamorphic is our marble. There is not a calcareous igneous stone. And then moving down, silicious uh, sedimentary would be our sandstones. Silicious metamorphic is our slates, quartzites, serpentines, and our soapstones. And finally, silicious igneous granites and basalts. Generally speaking, as we move from left to right, top to bottom across this chart, these materials tend to get harder and denser as a general rule. One thing we're going to talk about today is these general rules are great, but they are general. So within each material classification, we've got different considerations. We have to look at each material individually and assess it so that we can truly understand if it's the right application. Just because it's a granite, it may not be the right application. Just because it's a marble, it may not be the right application. Uh, doesn't mean all marbles fall in that, but that particular marble may not be appropriate. So as we're thinking about the stones we want to use, there's a number of defining characteristics that we need to consider. Uh, some of these qualities include absorption. How much water is this going to absorb and how is that going to affect my design? If I'm in a cool, cold climate, I don't want a material with a high absorption rate on the outside of the building because I'm looking at freeze thaw cycles affecting the performance. Uh, the density. Um, is, it, is it going to be strong enough and dense enough to hold up? And that ties into the absorption as well. Compressive strength, if I'm going to use this as a, as a stacked stone, or if I'm going to put it down as a paver and I'm going to have fire trucks running over, I better understand what that compressive strength is so that I know it's going to hold up. Abrasion resistance, uh, airport, mall, if I'm going to put a whole bunch of limestone down or marble on that floor, we need to understand that its abrasion resistance is adequate. It's going to hold up over time. Flexural strength, this is really going to tie more into cladding. I, uh, you know, I've got to, if I'm going to run up the side of a building, I've got to make sure I understand that it's got the bending strength that it's going to hold up. It's not something that the wind uh, or even seismic activity are going to have a major impact on. And then finally, modulus of rupture, which ties into flexural. It's a little, little different. But these are all the things we need to consider as we go about choosing material. Is it working? Have we run the litmus test with these particular items to make sure that, we're, that we uh, understand it? Most of these are 
we, we will get into this in another class, but most of these you can, you can uh, get the information through the EA, ASTM testing. So there's a test that will allow us to get results for each one of these on any given material, and that's the, the crucial information that we need uh, to, to make a final determination. Anybody heard of the Mohs scale of hardness? So this is a, this is a, it's an interesting um, visual. Um, if we look at it across the board, one is a talc, 10 is a diamond. So to put it in perspective, uh, basically a knife blade is going to hit at 5.5. So to give you some perspective as far as the hardness, one thing that's really important to remember with the Mohs scale is that it is a test on a specific mineral. And so while we might classify onyx, marble, or limestone as a three, where calcite normally falls, or we might put granite at a six or seven where feldspar and quartz test out, it's very important to remember that I can't then say that a limestone is indeed a three, or a granite is in fact a seven. This is where the ASTM 241, the testing of, of the abrasion really comes into play because this is neat, it's good to know, but stone is comprised of a number of these things. And so that test, the, the abrasion resistant test, gets us the average across the face of a material. So at one point I'm hitting quartz. Another point I might be hitting some rust iron oxide that isn't going to test out nearly as, as strong. So Mohs is great, but it's not something we, want, we don't need to say, make sure your granite tests at a Mohs of seven. It doesn't really work that way. It's the C241, so just a distinction I always like to make with that particular slide. And I've seen it that way. I've seen it specified. It's got to hit a Mohs of seven. Well, I, how do I test that? There, isn't, there really isn't a way to do that. So, But still, it's kind of neat. You can do a little test, too, with your knife blade. If you wanted to see, well, do I think it's granite? Maybe. Do a knife. If you run your knife blade, it doesn't really scratch. It does give you some idea that you are working in the granite side of things rather than like the limestone where it's going to. We mentioned absorption, and that as a, that's affected directly by the stone's porosity. So one thing that's important to remember is all stone is porous. Now, some stones are more porous than others, but all stones, and this is looking at the surface or the, the section of a stone, all stones have pores. And, but it's important to keep it it's relative. Um, granite is porous, but the pores are small, they're tight, and so it doesn't mean that it's not good for that particular use. But if I'm looking at a limestone, say a French limestone, which I've referred to as French bread, um, that stuff is quite porous. And so I'm not going to use it on the ground outside. I just, the pores are too big and there's too many of them. And again, porosity is something we can measure with an ASTM test, C97, that allows us to understand how much it's absorbing and what does that mean for us down the road. So, recap, test number one. Are quartz surfacing materials considered natural stones? No. Very good. Nice. Okay, what are the two types of mineral composition? Very nice. Silicious and calcareous. And then we've got three types of formations. Give me three formations and an example of each. Sedimentary, and that would be your sandstone? Yes. One of them, absolutely. What's another example of a formation? Yeah. That's right. Exactly. Very good. And finally, give me a third one. Igneous. Granite. Very nice. We can move on now. Nice work, everybody. Okay. Well, now that we've gone through module one, we've talked about the basic formation and the basic types of, of, of stones. Let's get into some more specifics about each one of those specific types. Let's start first with calcareous sedimentary limestone. Okay, limestone. It's a sedimentary rock consisting chiefly of the mineral calcite with or without magnesium carbonate. If we add the magnesium carbonate in there, we get into an adolamitic limestone. So we've got an oolitic, which is like an Indiana limestone, uh, dolomitic, as I said, has the calcium or uh, the, the, the uh, magnesium carbonate. And you can really tell the difference if you were to knock on uh, a dolomitic limestone, it's going to get that higher pitched ping, you know, whereas the other limestones, the more classics, are going to be uh, a little deader. So, limestone, it's a fantastic product. I really, I personally really like working with limestone. Uh, here's an example of a Molianos limestone quarry in Portugal. 
So it's really kind of a traditional deep pit quarry here. Um, and uh, the thing about limestone is it contains a lot of fossils, shell formations. That's one way to really tell that it is truly a limestone. It's got a lot of moving activity with it, and that's one thing that's neat about limestone is that it does, it looks like stone. And uh, I've, had a, I've had some really good success using limestone on all sorts of different applications. Uh, it's soft enough that you can carve it so you get more classic type architecture as you see here with these columns. Um, and uh, you can get it, you know, if it's vertical, uh, we can use a variety of them. One thing that's important to understand with it though, an example I like to use is um, I did a project once that was using French limestone, which it, as we talked about the density earlier on with the, we, that we can determine from ASTM testing. Concrete's about 150 pounds a cubic foot, um, which is about a medium density limestone. Well, the French stuff is about 125, so you can almost cut it with a, just a regular skill saw, don't need a diamond blade. So what does that mean? That means if I'm going to use it on a wall, I have to make sure I've done my engineering. And so what we had to do was go to a two inch thick uh, module with continuous anchors on this cladding job. So it's just important that we understand that, that uh, limestone does sort of run the gamut on, on its, uh, its density. And, and that affects how we're going to use it. But all in all, good product. One thing we should note right now with calcareous stones, because they are made up of calcium carbonate, they, the calcium carbonate is susceptible to etching uh, when, it, when it's exposed to acids. So citrus fruits, wines, vinegars, those sort of things. So we're showing a countertop here, not necessarily, to, it's a function of the, of the end user's expectations, but if, if we want long-term uh, appearance to look as though it just got installed, we need to really consider that in food prep areas, limestone may not be what the client's wanting. If, as in like, like as in Europe, where they really don't mind the patina that comes from that, uh, from the exposure to food prep and staining and what have you, then, then it's okay. But by and large in the U.S., we kind of like things to be just so, especially on big commercial work. So just, uh, just important to set the expectation early on with our customers. This is a example of a limestone cladding project in uh, Long Island, New York. So it, again, very versatile. We're able to use limestone in a lot of different ways. It's just important that we understand what's that, which limestone it is and that we've done our due diligence in determining that it is appropriate. All right, in the same family as limestone is travertine. Again, calcareous sedimentary. Very, very similar. It's effectively a limestone, the difference being that where it formed. So it formed uh, by chemical precipitation from solution in surface and groundwaters near the mouths of springs and caves, things like that. So you start to see in travertine the bug holes, as I call them, the little holes where all that water has percolated through them through the, through the years, the centuries, and uh, that gives it its appearance. That's what makes travertine travertine. Um, but again, it's something we need to be careful of in terms of how we're going to use it, doing our homework. Um, Desert Gold Quarry in Belen, uh, New Mexico. Uh, one thing that we need to be very clear on with travertine is it has pronounced anisotropic properties. And effectively, anisotropic means it's going to be much weaker in one orientation than in the other. So if I, take a, if I use the analogy of a deck of cards, a deck of cards, you stack them vertically. Um, that's sort of like as we take a block of travertine or any sedimentary stone out of the ground. If we slice it like a deck of cards that way, that's called a cross cut and it's going to look more cloudy and it's a little stronger in that orientation. But if I cut a, vertically through that deck of cards, I'm now cutting it in a vein cut orientation where I'm going to see all that sedimentary layering. It's beautiful, but it's weaker along that axis. So it's just important to understand that. Not something that's insurmountable. Uh, when I was in Portland, we did a 15,000 square foot travertine job, large panels, three foot, five foot, uh, three CM, tested it out, the flexing, the ASTM C880, Flexural testing all, all gave us the green light to go ahead and use it outside with a vein cut. So it's just important to know that it's going to be weaker in that orientation than it would be in a cross cut. So that is what anisotropic means. Um, as I mentioned, it's going to include holes, and that means what do I need to, uh, 
take into consideration in my application. Is it going on the floor? Well, that's fine. We're probably going to fill those, and often the fill is used with is a grout, a cementitious grout, or an epoxy. One thing to note with that, epoxies are a little more expensive, and it's limited generally to certain countries. Not all countries that produce travertine have the uh, the ability to do epoxy um, fill. So, Turkey, for example, it's going to be cementitious. Mexico is going to be a cementitious fill. Italy, on the other hand, they're going to be able to do uh, or apply a, a, an epoxy based. So important to note, one other thing with travertine that's important to note is if I'm going to use it on a floor, it is a higher maintenance stone than most other stones because of these holes. And what we have here is as we cut that, we can see certain holes, but we don't know how many holes are existing below that. Um, and so if we get a high heel, we get a point load on that floor, there are places where you're going to see some failure. Uh, the nice thing is it's very easy to fix. It's not the end of the world, but it is something to make your end uh, user aware of that uh, it, is, it is something to be ready to address. Getty Museum, lots of travertine, so it's great. You can use it outside if you've got the right product. Walnut travertine on a fireplace. And another great example here of a commercial lobby application in Noche Travertine. And that is travertine. Okay, calcareous sedimentary onyx. All right, this is a compact cryptocrystalline, generally translucent variety of calcite. It's usually deposited in cold water solutions. These are stalactites, stalagmites. These are formed in caves. And uh, it's really a, in my mind, it's more of an aesthetic material than anything else. Here's an onyx quarry in Turkey. Um, you gotta be careful with onyx because it is exceptionally vulnerable to chemical and mechanical attack. So I'm going to be very careful while I use it. On top of that, it's fairly expensive, so we've got to be, you know, we got, we're going to be careful where we use it. Often we see it in backlit environments. It might be the back wall of a nice lobby. Uh, it can be the, the, the clock tower behind the clock. So there's some neat, neat ways to use it. Just have to be very careful because it, it, it is a little more susceptible to, to those attacks. A great example of onyx. Uh, Here's vein cut. You can see it's backlit, so it has a ver it's got a lot of aesthetic value. Another example here of a white onyx. Okay, calcareous metamorphic. We're talking about marble now. So a metamorphic rock consisting of fine to coarse grain recrystallized calcite and or dolomite. So the the neat thing with marble is because it is metamorphic, because it had all that heat and pressure applied to it causing the changes, you get a lot of beauty out of it. You get a lot of movement, you get a lot of veining. And uh, here's a great example of a, of a marble here. Um, one thing I should note is you're presenting these classes, and I failed to do this before, but bring a lot of samples. Um, the, the designers, architects really like seeing a variety of samples. And I would also be sure you let them know what it is. What is it? Where does it come from? Because it's interesting to them as well. So anyway, marble sample, pass that around for, for everybody to look at. Um, one important thing to note about marble is that the Marble Institute of America has a process where they classify the marbles. And they classify those, it's, it's, a, it's a classification of the marble soundness. And it's an A, a B, a C, or a D. And it's not intended to be a measurement of the stone's quality, or of its market value, or anything else. It's strictly intended to give you an indication of the workability of the material. An A, such as a Carrera White, a Vermont Danby, some of those, they're, they're, they're very clean. There's not a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, different minerals in it. There's not a lot of heavy veining in it. Um, that's an indication of its soundness. It's an A. You cut this, I, as a fabricator, can predict that I'm not going to have to do a lot of work to clean up that edge. I know I'm going to cut it and it's going to be by and large, it's going to hold itself together. Same thing as an installer. Um, I know while I have to be careful with any stone that I'm installing, uh, with the marble, it's not as delicate as, say, a Class C or a Class D, like a Dark Imperador. Now, the Dark Imperador is, is a, great, a great example of a D, which is a really beautiful material. If you're familiar with it, I would here have a sample of it. All sorts of different inclusions and color variations and veining. 
And that's what makes it a D because as I go to cut that, it's going to fall apart. Now the nice thing with the soundness is the MIE does allow for repair of those materials. So it doesn't mean we can't use them. It just means that we need to know how to work with them. Cream of Marfil is another great example. Very, very strong, very dense. It's on, the, on par with most granites in terms of its compressive strength. However, getting it from the quarry, the blocks, to the slab, cut the size in the crates to the job, there's a lot of room for air in there for it to break because it's got a lot of veining. And, uh, but once it's down, it's fantastic. So you'll see a lot of times those marbles have a resident mesh backing on them. And uh, they're there because the, the fabricators need it. The, the factory needs that on there to get it uh, from point A to point B in the factory. And then it's good for us in the shipping as well and the handling to get it installed. So some other variables we need to think about when we have that, marble, that mesh on the back of it, uh, the epoxy grouts, the different systems we have to think about to make sure that bonds in a warrantable system. But that's a, an, another class. So here's a white Carrera quarry in Carrera, Italy. Um, Nice classic deep pit, uh, deep pit quarry. Uh, we mentioned uh, the aesthetic values. It's beautiful stuff. Um, and it, you just get a whole variety of different things. So this is a piece of uh, Carrera Joy, it looks to me, on this slide. and um, Pretty consistent stuff, as, and then you can go run the gamut on it. Uh, again, with, with use as a countertop, we're seeing that as a more and more desired material. And again, it's fine if we set the proper expectation for the end user. So it might be easier to sell a homeowner on the use of marble because they absolutely love it and they understand that, well, it's, ca it's got a calcium carbonate bake makeup and if I spill wine on it, it's going to etch it. So as long as they understand that, the end user knows what's going, what to expect, then, then there should be no issue. But it's good stuff. We often recommend that you hone it if you're gonna use it in a countertop because effectively etching it with a, with a lemon or wine or something, you're, you're effectively honing the surface. So if you put a hone finish on it initially rather than polished, you are helping to offset that, that appearance. And, and you won't see it straight on, you're gonna see it in reflection if you're standing, you know, standing off to the side, so. Nice Calcutta marble uh, application in a bathroom. So again, think about your finish. Hone floor, people walking out of the shower, I don't know if I want polished or in the shower, I may want to put home for sure, so I'm cognizant of that slip resistance or resistance uh, to slipping. Okay, module two recap. Calcareous stones. Can you name a calcareous stone within each of the following formation categories? A sedimentary. Travertine. Very nice. A metamorphic. Marble. Awesome. Igneous. No. Yeah, that's awesome. And some common applications for the following types of calcareous stones. Limestone. Calcium. Yeah, we sort of said, we said, yeah, it's based on the material and the application, right? So that's the neat thing about limestone. Travertine, it's in the same boat. Uh, onyx. Clock tower. There you go, clock tower. Got to be careful of that. And marble. Pitchman. There we go. And I, I didn't note this on the marble. I, I should. I usually go into this on the marble where outside is, I just don't really go there uh, using marble in an exterior application. Um, we've got issues with the phenomenon called hysteresis where uh, a lot of the whites and the greens, if they get, ex you know, they get exposed to the elements, they tend to, they tend to warp. They actually change their physical composition. And we've seen that fail where the bond is lost and that's a problem. So marble, I would never use it outside as a paver. Um, I, I, there are some varieties you can get away with using on vertical work, but by and large, keep it inside. And uh, with limestone as well, there's very few that I would use outside in a paver. Very, very few. Vertical is a different orientation. So there's module two. All right, moving from calcareous onto our siliceous uh, stones. We'll start with silicious sedimentary sandstone, which is a clastic sedimentary rock composed of grains of sand size of a sixteenth of a millimeter to two millimeters, set in a matrix of silt or clay and united by a cementing material, commonly silica, iron oxide, or calcium carbonate. The sand particles are commonly quartz. So sandstone is um, 
it's a it's a pretty it's a nice material. It's it's good in a lot of different applications. Here's a quarry in Colorado, the red sandstones. Um, one thing to be cognizant of sandstone is it is a little more porous than other materials, so we've got to be careful where we're using it. Um, it is good for for an abrasive surface um, for non-slip, particularly in a natural cleft finish. So with with sandstone. As we, as we quarry that, this is a little different than, say, quarrying limestone or marble. As we're pulling these, these blocks of sandstone out, they tend to want to separate along their, along their cleavage plane or along those sedimentary layers we discussed. And you get a, a neat, natural, clefted finish. It's called a cleft where that is separated. And that adds a, just by nature, gives you a nice non-slip system. Um, some are a little more aggressive than others in terms of you got to be careful of trip hazard, but it, it is a naturally a nice non-slip surface. Um, can be honed. And one thing I'm always careful to note with sandstones, if I want to go vertical with it, um, if I'm going to hang it in a, in, a, in a cladding system, I might want to consider dowels instead of kerfs um, because it, it tends to, the kerfs tend to sort of work against its, its weaknesses. So again, that's an engineer, that's your that's your system that you're designing. Um, and most of the sandstones are resistant to chemical and salt deterioration. So it's by and large pretty, a pretty nice product to use outside. A couple of examples here where it's uh, in a stacked stone, oakwood sandstone, and then in a flagstone uh, application. Here again, this is a veneer, a veneer system and, uh, and again on the, on the paving. So. The right sandstone is, is, is really a, a, good, a good product. All right, so let's just metamorphic. Serpentine. This, basically, it's, com it's comprised principally of the mineral serpentine. Um, they got a greasy or silky luster, kind of a light soapy feeling to it. Um, we haven't seen a lot of use of it lately. There was, a, there was much more use of it, I'd say, you know, 15, 20 years ago. But... Still, it's a very nice material. Um, here's the, the serpentine quarry in Vermont. You can see it's an extremely deep pit quarry. So here's another example where I'm going to do my homework is just the right product, not only from its performance, but you know, maybe from a cost perspective. Getting down out of uh, this, the blocks out of that hole is a whole lot different than maybe getting out of a more of an open, open quarry. So just something to, to, to consider, not only just how is it performed, but how are we getting it you know, out of, the, out of the mountain or out of the quarry. Here's an example of a photo of it. Um, does have a wide uh, range in quality and performance due to its diverse mineral content. And then we talked about the most earlier, the most scale, it's two and a half to five, depending on that, that's kind of that average. So here we see it in an exterior application for some cladding, the very antique serpentine out of, out of uh, Vermont. Again, here's some architectural uh, trim uh, on this exterior building here. Soapstone. It's a metamorphic stone, a rock composed of one or more minerals, including talc, magnesium, dolomite, micas, and chlorite. Um, the texture can be massive to fibrous or flaky, and the best commercial grades are highly compacted and are low in absorption. So often you will see this used in, uh, in laboratory applications because it is very resistant to chemical attack. It's great for, uh, for kitchens. Um, here's the Albemarle Quarry in Virginia. And uh, it is soft. That's one thing to keep in mind. But the, the thing about it being soft is it's easy to repair. So if you do get scratches on it, it's, it's easy to, to repair. So often you'll see it in a counter type application where they've treated it with mineral oil, which the lower portion of this photo is, 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 shows that, where as quarried or as finished at the quarry, and then below with the mineral oil application, it really brings out the rich tones. Um, green iron soapstone here, soapstone veneer, so it's got some uh, variety of uses. Uh, here's a nice kitchen, and again, I said sometimes you'll see this in a laboratory setting. Okay, slate, compact microcrystalline metamorphic rock usually formed from shale deposits. Uh, slate's an interesting material, and this, this photo is very indicative and very illustrative in terms of how do we go about choosing the right material. And as you see from this photo of the quarry, it doesn't look anything like the Travertine quarry or the Carrera quarry. This stuff comes out in sheets. So 
We know that it's metamorphic, but it acts very much like a sedimentary in that it's got these cleavage planes, and those will delaminate one from the other. Uh, so it's important that we understand that in terms of how we're going to use it. If I'm going to go on a wall with it outside, it may the quarry might tell you don't do it because those those planes can delaminate. Um, cladding that's tough to you know you, you run a kerf along that plane you've just now you're, you're really you're really weakening the stone so we have to really do our homework there. Um, and some slates are going to be better than others. Some I would never use outside. Some of the multicolors. Uh, you can see the clefting or the, the cleavage planing on it flakes off very easily. Um, some others, some of the Brazilians, for example, are, are a little denser and you don't have as much concern with that. But one thing to note here is you see these come out in these little sheets. Um, I ran into a project once where we wanted to use slate and we wanted to use a, qu a quarry that was within 500 miles of the project so we could take advantage of some of the lead material resources credits available. However, the pattern that the architect chose required four foot by four foot pieces. And if you look at that relative to the men standing there, you can probably see there aren't very many pieces that are going to be that large. And that's precisely what this quarry said to us. And it would have taken them a couple years to get the quantity needed to finish the project. And nobody has that kind of time. So had to modify the design a little bit. But again, early on, understand, is it appropriate? How is it quarried? And will that allow me to do what I want to do with it? Or do I need to, I, I like the material enough where there's another goal, such as the lead goal that I'm trying to achieve on the project, I'm willing to compromise the design or the pattern to make that work. We talked about anisotropic properties with travertine. Slate is exceptionally anisotropic, as I just suggested. It does have a slaty cleavage quality that allows it to be split into thin sheets. And again, exterior freeze thaw is not kind to some of these materials, so we have to make sure we're very careful. Here's some more slate applied, um, black slate, uh, prairie slate, and some dolomitic limestone here. And this is a nice slate floor. This is kind of the multicolor uh, shangli slate. It's fantastic for this application inside. Again, may not be the right thing outside. Okay, so let's just metamorphic, quartzite. It's a metamorphic rock consisting mainly of quartz formed by recrystallization of sandstone by regional or thermal metamorphism. Quartzite's really a neat product. Here's an example, uh, the metaquartzite quarry in Nevada. This stuff is really nice. It's really, really dense material, which allows it to be um, utilized in a lot of different ways. So countertops, quartzite is fantastic because you can get a lot of these neat looks with that metamorphosism, you do get those neat, uh, the color variation. And what, uh, what that allows for, though, is, is sort of a marble look in a kitchen countertop that is resistant to staining. It's also resistant to weathering. So all in all, good stuff, dense, and uh, there's a lot of uses for it. Cost is something to consider, um, and availability, you know, depending on what we're trying to do with it. Uh, if I'm trying to do a lot of cut to size stuff with it and I'm using a Brazilian quartzite, I've got to be careful. That may, may not be conducive to what those factories are focused on over there, whereas if it's something out of China, they're much more uh, in tune with, with uh, doing more of a custom cut to size work. Same thing with a Vegas Rock, for example. They're very good at, at being able to, to do just about any application. A couple more examples, a nice floor. Azul Makauba on the countertop there. And here's the meta quartzite from Las Vegas on these bar tops here. If you've ever gone to Las Vegas and you go to the Aria Hotel, they've got the, all over the exterior cladding. So. All right, into igne igneous, silicious igneous. We have got our basalt. So basalt, dark colored, fine grained igneous rock composed of plagioclase and pyroxene minerals. Basalts can range from gray to black in color. Um, these are often uh, the Northwest, Pacific Northwest is a great place where there's a lot of basalt. Um, we get some out of China, there's some great stuff out of Italy. This is basically lava as it's cooled. One thing to be conscientious of with basalts, here's a quarry in China, you can see that they're like a hexagonal shape. Uh, they're only so big, so basalt's another example of we got to make sure we know what we're trying to do with it. We're not exceeding the physical properties of that material, so if I want to do a large format paver that's 72 inches long and 48 wide, I can't get 48 inches out of that. Or if I can maybe, if I can, it's going to be very limited. So 
knowing what we're dealing with. Um, some are good for wet environment applications. Uh, it's highly abrasion resistant compared to marbles and limestone, so it's really a, it's, it's a nice, good, solid material. Uh, I've used it indoor, outdoor, and, and it, it holds up very well. Great example here is some treads. We got some veneer, uh, even some interior applications on the floor and on, on the walls. So, silicious igneous granite, another example here of a Dakota mahogany. Um, there's a geologic definition of, uh, that is a plutonic rock in which quartz makes up 10 to 50 percent of the felsic components, and the alkali felsbar to total felsbar ratio is between 65 and 95 percent. Commercially, that means any holocrystalline quartz bearing plutonic rock. Um, so the great thing with granite is it is it is really really the most usable and the most flexible product out there for for application. Dakota mahogany granite in uh, South Dakota, classic granite quarry. Um, blocks come out, stick them on the saw, and create slabs, and we can do what we want with them at that point. It does have a high abrasion resistance, so by and large, using it in a commercial flooring application, for example, uh, I'm not going to have too many concerns. I can always verify that with the ASTM testing, but it's dense, strong stuff, so I, I can feel very confident in it. Um, it does have great chemical uh, and weathering resistance. And as we talked about anisotropic properties in slate and travertine, granite would be the opposite in that it is nearly isotropic. So I can take that block out of the mountain and I can turn it in any orientation I want to, cut it, and it's going to have the same basic characteristics regardless of which way I, I slice that deck of cards. So if I'm doing exterior pavers, I can sleep well using granite. Um, wall cladding, same thing. There's just a lot of uses we can do with it and, and know that it's going to perform well. Uh, as a countertop material, we all know there's, I mean, there's more granite to choose from than, than we could count. So this uh, commercially, it's fantastic as well. This is Iridian, uh, Rockville White and Superior Granite at the Ralph L. Carr Colorado Judicial System, um, Pinnacle Award winner in 2013. So that is module three. Do a quick recap for module three, see how we're doing. Uh, can you name a siliceous stone within each of the following formation categories? Sedimentary. Very nice. Metamorphic. Yep, slate and quartzite as well. And igneous? Granite basalt. Very good. Common applications for the following types of siliceous stones. Soapstone. Um, chemistry lab. That's one of them, yep. Countertop is predominantly uh, the use there. Slate. Flooring. Flooring. Interior. Yep, ideally. Quartzite. Countertop. Yep. Flooring. Yep, exactly. Great countertop material and granite. Yeah, you name it. Absolutely. Very good. You've passed module three. All right. Moving from our module three, and we'll talk about knowing your stone. Um, it's important, as we've gone through all the characteristics of the different types of materials, the limestones, travertines, marbles, granite, and so on, it's important to know that within each of those classifications, all stones are unique. Um, so I might have, you know, to go to mahogany one day and then six months later I may have some different properties from that same material coming out of the quarry at that particular time. So it's important to understand that even within one type of stone we can have some unique properties, um, which again makes it critical that we're identifying a specific material to ensure that it is appropriate for the use. Reiterating again that how do we understand that? We use our ASTM testing data to understand that we're using it in an appropriate way, okay? Also, perception of color will vary depending on the orientation, lighting of surrounding materials. So it's important as we are sampling, for example, we want to make sure we're, we're looking at these samples in the same sort of light, in the same orientation as much as possible uh, as it will be installed in ultimately. So if I'm putting in a lobby and I'm going to have uh, some afternoon sun casting in through the windows, you know, let's try to look at it in all those different situations so that we understand that, that, that we've, 
who's done her homework and we're not surprised by anything. All right, some stones are categorized commercially under a different definition than what it might be called by the quarry, or scientifically rather. Um, photo on the bottom left here, is that a marble or a quartzite? And there's some, there is, there is some, uh, there is some argument. Some call that a marble and some call it a quartzite. Um, we call it a quartzite. Granite or gabbro? Technically, absolute black, it's technically a gabbro. Commercially, we call it a granite. And the, the, on the far right there, is that granite or nice? Technically, it's nice. Commercially, we call it granite. So just, it, it, it's uh, just important. It's not necessarily important from a uh, executive level. It is important, though, as we go through and get technical information on it. So. Okay, we'll get into fabrication and finishes here. Um, there's some neat things we can do with, with, with uh, our finishes. This is an example of marble using a book matched orientation. So two slabs in the block adjacent, we open them up like a book and we finish those opposing faces and we get a really nice aesthetic look here. So we've probably seen some neat examples of that out in the world. Um, we've got uh, the ability to diamond match as well. So as we, we're taking now four slabs and we're creating uh, a nice feature or a series of features within a, uh, within a, within a space. Slip matched, we're going to take that veining and, and we're going to orient it's the, the panel so that we get a nice linear look in whichever way we want to orient that. And we talked, we hit on this a little bit earlier, but here's a nice illustration of that deck of cards that we talked about, vein cut versus flurry cut. So as we use the deck of cards analogy, if I'm going to cut against those, those uh, cards, I'm going to get that vein look. And we, just to reiterate, that does affect the properties, the strength uh, of the material and how we're going to use it. So just making sure that if we go to test our materials, that we're testing it in the proper orientation. A travertine uses cladding. If I'm going to go vein cut, I better make sure my testing ASTM C880 and my compressive strength, all those things are being tested in the proper orientation. Um, and then there's the aesthetics of it as well. So a number of different finishes that are available, okay? We have our smooth finishes, which are effectively our polish and our hone finishes. These are achieved based on the grit of the, of the polishing heads that they use at the factory. So the higher the grit, we're going to get a polished finish. We use a lower grit, we get into more of a honed finish. And there's the advantages. We've talked a little bit about them. Uh, there's an advantage to using honed in certain applications. If I'm going on the floor, honed is going to be ideal uh, in terms of helping us to um, limit our slip uh, potential. We want, to, we want to maximize our slip resistance. So polished typically is going to be slippery. This depends on the material, though, so it's important that we've tested that out. We get some light textures, so sandblasted, acid washed. These might be great for an exterior paving application uh, where I know I have to have some, some definite slippers if this hone isn't going to work for me. Uh, the nice thing, too, with textures, we can create some interest. We can even go vertical with this stuff and just create a nice, uh, some nice features using different, different finishes. Uh, brushed, tumbled. Um, one thing with brushed, we just got to be careful. We're, we're, we're basically going back over this after we've, we, we've uh, sandblasted it or maybe we've, we've flamed it or something, and then we're going to go hit it with a brush. It can cause it to be slippery again. So just, again, doing our homework on that. Uh, great example of brushed and chiseled, sandblasted and brushed. Gives us that, the, the, the unique or the antique or the leather finishes we're hearing more and more about. We want more heavy texture. We know we don't want any slip issues. So if I'm using stair treads in a granite, I'm going to put a flame finish on it. I know I'm not going to have any problems there. Again, outside pavy, pavers, flamed is going to give us that the best slip resistance we can, we can hope for. Uh, flamed interior may not be the best choice on the ground. Okay, we, We've opened up some of the pores. We've created some, some depth and some layering, some texture. That's a pocket for dirt to collect. So if I'm using a light coat material and I flame it, and I want to use it inside, I may have a potential maintenance uh, concern. It looks dirty, it's not, but I can't help, it, help the, the, the dirt from collecting in those pores and ridges. Um, we get into some more heavy textures, deep line cleft. There's uh, split faced, bush hammered, all things we can utilize to, whether it's aesthetic or performance uh, enhancements. Okay. 
just to go over some of the resources that are available to you as you go through and specify materials. Um, there's, we've talked about the ASTM testing, there's ANSI testing, CE and ICC, all these are available for us. The standards are there to help us know that, we've, that we're making the right choices, that we're on the right path. Within the industry, we've got uh, the Marble Institute, Natural Stone Council, BSI, National Granite, uh, NTCA, TCNA, all these are set up here with standards and guidelines to help all of us through the process, whether we're the specifier, the supplier, the quarry, the fabricator, the installer, it's all there for us to give us the tools we need to, to, uh, to make sure we're using the proper material, applying them in the proper way, using the, the appropriate setting methods and so on. So these resources are available um, to you. Additional resources from the MIA specifically, we've got the Dimensional Stone Design Manual, which if you don't have, let's make sure, that, that we, let's get you one because they're fantastic. Uh, I reference them regularly. Uh, we have iPad apps. Um, MIA technical bulletins that come out uh, on a somewhat regular basis if there's something that's changed from the DSDM or, uh, or uh, a particular topic at hand that will come out that adds, adds a little more uh, light to the issue. And then you got the MIA membership directory including accredited fabricators and contractors. So MIA is here as a resource and has made these tools available to help you in this process. So thank you for coming today. Make sure you signed in. Make sure you get me that evaluation form. And uh, please reach out to us if you have any other questions. Thank you.